So good evening, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, friends, family. Uh, thank you so much for coming this evening. I sincerely appreciate it. I'm very humbled by uh, you all coming. I'm very honored by the fact that you all made, uh, made yourselves available because this is kind of a, a strange time of the day to come to a, a lecture. And so I sincerely appreciate also for people coming very far. I'm going to present this lecture in English um, because of international guests and, and other people who don't know, understand Afrikaans, but there will be an Afrikaans translation of this lecture on, uh, uh, in, in printed format outside afterwards. So what is happening this evening is, is uh, more than 40 years dream of mine being fulfilled, so I'm extremely happy to be here and, and very excited and happy to share this evening with you. Thank you so much. I'm going to break convention this evening um, and by firstly saying thank you. And um, I know that usually at uh, these lectures the thank yous come afterwards, but I wouldn't have been here in the first place if it wasn't for a, very, a number of very special people in my life. And so I would like to firstly thank them all. The first person is my wife, Michelle. Uh, this was a picture taken at our engagement. And, um, yeah, thank you very much, Michelle, for all your love and support over many years. I sincerely appreciate it. I know it's tough being married to an academic and a person who doesn't stop studying. And um, uh, I sincerely appreciate your support over many years. Um, I know that it's uh, been hard in terms of the time that I spent with you and uh, attention. And uh, a good example has been the last few days and weeks preparing this lecture. So I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you very much. The second people is my mom and dad, Nick and Kiki. Thank you so much for everything you've done for me over many years, for your support, your love, um, that you allowed me to study what I wanted to study, that you, that you allowed me to study in the first place, that you um, supported me in, 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 in uh, being an academic, and um, that you never tried to steer me in a direction that I didn't want to go in. Also, my Oma Maike, Grandmother Maike, Ladies and gentlemen, this lady is nearly 93 years old. Um, <laughs> she looks wonderful. She survived the Second World War in, in, uh, in the Netherlands, um, Nazi occupation of the Netherlands, and she made it to South Africa and uh, survived five children and under dif <laughs> difficult conditions. So, uh, so sincerely appreciate that Omar is here and, and that you are able to, to share this special event with me. So thank you so much. Um, my mother-in-law, Alida, thank you so much for, for being here and for your love and support. You are a second mother to me and, and I appreciate you so much. My brother and sister, uh, Yuhu and Marissa, and uh, the, the spouses, uh, Francois and Elena, thank you also for your support and love over many years. And um, my lovely daughter, Skilly. <laughs> so those of you who don't know Skilly, Skilly is, uh, is uh, the love of my life. And uh, <laughs> unfortunately, she couldn't be here this evening, but uh, she wanted to. And uh, uh, I know who's going to greet me when I get home this afternoon. And uh, thank you so much for the joy you give to me in my life and for your love. Another person who couldn't be here is Rob Warren, and um, uh, I'm very sad about that. He's sitting in, the, in Australia this evening. Um, Rob uh, has been a close colleague and friend of mine for many years. Um, I, I regard him as one of the greatest scientists that I know uh, alive, and he's, um, he's just wonderful in terms of scientific knowledge. Um, thank you so much for him, for all he's done to, to, for me over the many years, and for being a good friend, a true mentor and a stimulating colleague. Also, Paul, thank you very much for everything you've done for me over many years. Um, it's been a pleasure and an honor to be part of your center for close to 20 years. And I sincerely appreciate that you made a space for me there also and that you supported me and, and in, my, in my endeavors. And then, of course, Albert Bayes. Um, Albert was a person who recruited me to this faculty many years ago, uh, end of 1997. He, um, he uh, appointed me as a research assistant in his, in his uh, group, and uh, we affectionately called him Adia. Um, unfortunately, he passed away while I was still busy with my PhD, and um, it's, it's, uh, I never got the chance to thank him for bringing me in and you know, um, 
allowing me to get into the field of tuberculosis. Uh, but his wife is here this evening, Louise, I'm not sure where you are, but I'm so thankful that you are here this evening and uh, appreciate it very much and it's, it's really f a wonderful for me to see you again. The members of the mycobacteromics group and the molecular epidemiology group, so this uh, was taken in 2009 uh, when the group was still small, it's much larger now, many of these members are, are here this evening. Uh, thanks for all you've done over the years, Division of Molecular Biology and Human Genetics, which used to be the Department of Bi Medical Biochemistry. Everyone involved in there. So many students, honors, masters, PhDs, postdocs, colleagues, collaborators, friends. I mean, I can't start to thank everyone personally, but there's been many over the years. Uh, new colleagues and friends, Jimmy and Therese, Mariki, Eben, and uh, of course, Sonia and all the other ladies in the Dean's Division, and everyone else here and my Stellenbosch University. So I've, I've grown to, over the last 20 years, love this institution. Uh, I love the people here and I, I, I'm really thankful for the place that you've provided for me. Finally, I would just like to s dedicate this lecture to the memory of my two grandfathers, Nikul Gai van Petir's fourth and Jugo van der Beil. And um, I, I have inherited many characteristics of both of them and um, so I wish they could be here to share this event with me this evening and I just hope I made them proud. So uh, over the past few weeks while preparing this inaugural lecture, I have become to understand that it's actually a, a, an extremely difficult task to do. It's nothing trivial to prepare. You have to convince firstly your family that all the time that you spend away from home <laughs> is, uh, was worth it, that all the time you spend on students and conferences and workshops and going overseas and visiting people and that, that all of this time away from them was worthwhile. You also have to convince your parents that it was, uh, uh, that it was a good investment to actually ma allow you to study so long, and uh, even though you decided to use that education to become an academic. And um, you have to convince your friends that uh, being an academic is actually a real job, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that you're not spending public funding on playing around in a lab. Um, but uh, also very importantly, you have to convince your colleagues that it was really a good decision to actually promote you to full professor. Um, that you've actually reached that stage in your, in your academic career, we can say that you've actually made a substantial contribution to the world of science and uh, that you should be recognized as such. The mere fact that both the English and Afrikaans languages has a word like professorable I don't know if how many of you know that, but there's a word in English and Afrikaans, a professor, professor Abel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, meaning that you are at that stage where you're able to be promoted to a full professor um, is, is really a cause for anxiety for me today and has been for the past few weeks because um, I would need to uh, be able to convey my professorability to you <laughs> this evening. This you have to do all the, all the while um, taking, into, um, uh, in taking into account and recognizing that you would never have been here if it wasn't for your collaborators, your colleagues, your students who contributed enormously to your work and to what you've done. You all know that publish or perish is, uh, is the mantra of science and, and what we do. But I personally feel that even more important um, a maxim for scientists uh, was, is the saying collaborate or die. And I actually added in big letters in, in the top of my laboratory space um, um, over the years. And so an uh, inaugural lecture should therefore be a celebration with these people that all contributed to you being here. Um, this lecture can therefore not be the same as a lecture that you give at an uh, international conference, something that you've done thousands of times before in front of an audience of your peers um, and people consisting of your discipline. It can't be the same and it is very different. This is a special lecture which you probably would never repeat again in your life. Um, it needs to be nuanced in such a way that, it's, uh, that it addresses all of the things that I mentioned before. Um, and um, that, that, that is really a difficult thing. You are speaking to a wide audience with different interests. I'm therefore acutely aware of the fact that I might not fulfill all your expectations and I ask your forgiveness and understanding of that. So in preparation for this inaugural, I tried to do some background reading to see what is an inaugural should look like, what is the structure of an inaugural lecture. And I went to that, um, that source of all knowledge, Wikipedia, <laughs> to try and see if I can find out. And you wouldn't believe it, but there's actually no page for inaugural lectures at, in, on Wikipedia. <laughs> so that was quite dis, disheartening. And um, 
despite it being practiced in hundreds of institutions worldwide and through hundreds of years, uh, no one actually has a guideline anywhere on the internet for what you should do during an inaugural lecture. So that gives you the one hand the freedom to do whatever you want, and that's exactly what I'm going to do this evening. But on the other hand, it also provides the opportunity that you start to doubt yourself to see whether you're actually fulfilling the expectations. Fortunately, I've attended and watched many inaugural lectures over the years, and so I crystallized some thoughts on what it should contain. Uh, Professor Wayne Derman uh, told me to drop the hard academics and direct it so that your family and friends can understand what you're doing and to have as much fun with the talk as possible. Um, and this is quite a wide brief and does not really narrow it down much. But thank you very much, Wayne. I appreciate your advice. <laughs> when Arada Maya told me to, uh, that it doesn't um, really matter what you're saying, it's the way you say it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Thanks for that advice, Werner. <laughs> I also appreciate that. <laughs> but what became clear to me is that the inaugural lecture should cater for a number of different audiences. In a nutshell, family and friends who know you well, who know your history, your personal life, would like to have a glimpse of what you're doing every day. And um, your colleagues and, and, and people who you work with, your students who know your professional career, wants to have a glimpse of who you are as a person. What, where did you come from? How did you end up in, in the place that you are today and um, in this point in time? So it's actually a complex balancing act between science communication, biography, um, history, public engagement, by, um, and scientific presentation. For me personally, it was a pause for reflection. I, I spent many hours just thinking about this and, and thinking back over my life and my field of study and something which I actually in fact enjoyed quite a lot. I will therefore present this lecture in three parts. The first part will be my personal story where I will just give a brief overview for those people who don't know me very well of um, who I am and where I came from and how I came to this point in my life. In part two I would briefly like to share with you uh, one of my other passions, and Jimmy alluded to that, and that's genealogy. genealogy. So I'd like to link that onto the third part of the lecture, which would be around the intertwined genealogies of mycobacteria and man. So many people sitting right here would know the first part of the lecture very well, some of the others would know the second part of the lecture very well, and some of them won't, uh, of you won't know anything. But uh, <laughs> I do hope that every one of you go out of here this evening uh, taking a piece of me with you, and that, that would make me very happy. And, um, I sincerely hope that that would be the case. So that's me, and this is my story. Uh, I was born in, in Pretoria, like Jimmy said, 1973. That's my mom. I think you were 24 years old, mom. <laughs> uh, Therese Fish, by the way, asked me to show some baby pictures and, and, and young pictures, so please bear with me. Now she's not even here this evening. <laughs> And so I uh, spent about seven years in Pretoria, then we moved to Kimberley, five years there, um, and then uh, we went to Durban where I, where I finished most of my life. And uh, I was actually um, quite an introvert, I am still. Um, I loved reading, like Jimmy said. Since childhood I was not a person who really excelled in sports. Uh, academics was my interest, my interest in something that I loved. Um, I read all the encyclopedias and, and things in, in, the, in the house, everything that I could lay my hands on. There wasn't internet, so books were the things that you, that you read. But for you to understand who I am, I would like to take you back 33 years. Uh, and this is a 50 second clip, so bear with me for this video. This was filmed by my, my grandmother's sister in 1982 in Kimberley. And that's my brother and sister swimming there. Um, my sister and my brother. And they're having fun. It looks like they're having a race. Obviously, at that, that stage, there was no sound on video. Uh, and you probably are wondering where I am in this, in this picture. <laughs> so just uh, yeah, nice smile. <laughs> that's my, my grandmother's sister. And you will see me right now. Yep, that's me. <laughs> so they... <laughs> So they're playing around in the pool. <laughs> I don't really care what they're doing. <laughs> I'm just reading. So, so at this stage, I was about nine years old. Um, and uh, yeah, that was, that was typical of my life. I don't think my parents will agree. 
Uh, I grew up to be very liberal-minded. I was anti-establishment. I was a very keen supporter of the full free music movement. Ari, you, you remember those days with Quiscom Bass and those guys. Um, we attended these uh, uh, interracial camps. We, you know, tried to link up the, the races again and try and sort out things. This was four years before, before the time of the, of the democracy. And um, after those years, I, I went for my national service in the Navy in 1992. Uh, spent some time on the strike craft uh, in the SIS Jan Smut strike craft with Tiller. Uh, uh, was a diesel, diesel mechanic uh, at that stage, and so you wouldn't believe it, but I, I was a diesel mechanic in this boat. Uh, after that, I uh, was forced to go to Potchefstroom University. <laughs> <laughs> Something which my parents hear a lot, <laughs> so they're used to it. Uh, I came from Durban, so I was very liberal and open-minded, and Potchefstroom was very conservative. And so I had quite a hard time there, especially since I had some long hair. <laughs> and um, uh, at some stage, I had a nice goatee and I had an earring, and uh, that didn't go well with the Potchefstroom people. But anyway, uh, I finished my BSc in microbiology, microchemistry. During those years, I actually also did some sports. You wouldn't believe it. Um, I was the captain of the fencing team, and. Uh, played rugby, hockey, cricket. Uh, many years later, I actually finished the Commerce Marathon twice and, and also the Two Oceans Marathon. So I actually, you know, I didn't do well. It was 11 hours, but I still finished it. <laughs> <laughs> <So> <laughs> In 1994, during my second year of study, I was introduced to the field of molecular biology. And this is where things changed. Molecular biology was fascinating. Um, this was the book that made, uh, that made me uh, this thing's not, sorry, I uh, switched it off by mistake. This is the book that, uh, that made, it, uh, made the change. Uh, it was written or co-written by James Watson, of course, of the Watson and Crick fame, people who solved the structure of DNA. And it, it was totally fascinating to me. And in fact, I actually was able to meet James Watson many years later uh, on a fellowship with, uh, with Echo Oppen. We, both of us got a fellowship to, to go to this conference where um, James Watson and Francis Crick was awarded. And it was such a pleasure to be able to meet him um, because this is a person who changed my life in terms of where I went, wanted to go and what I wanted to be. In fact, he also signed my, my old copy of The Double Helix. So I was very excited to have his signature also in, in this book. Anyway, I was fascinated by the central dogma of molecular biology. I mean, you have this DNA that's inherited through generations, gets transcribed to messenger RNA, which gets translated into protein, and everything we are and everything you see in front of you are, are made up of those proteins and uh, uh, you know, the enzyme reactions and everything that's involved in that. Just to give you an example of the beauty of molecular biology, this is a bacterial alpha hemolysin. And you can see it's a pore-forming toxin. That stalk that you see there in, in, in that picture there um, is, is perfectly designed to span the plasma membrane of eukaryotic cells, causes the lysis of red blood cells. And check that perfect hole that it makes in the membrane. And so I was really fascinated by this field of study. Those are some more, more molecular structures. That's human hemoglobin. That's a papillomavirus capsid protein, a divalent metal um, cation, uh, uh, transporter and, uh, of, of course, the structure of DNA. But I wonder how many of you have ev ever seen a kinesin motor protein uh, pulling a vesicle along a microtubule? And that's a picture of it. Did you know that this is actually happening in the cells of your body at this stage while you're sitting here? I mean, uh, no, people, people don't realize the beauty of what's actually on a molecular basis happening in, 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 in everything we see. And so, uh, these things were the things that drew my attention and that really fascinated me. Uh, I was also fascinated by recombinant DNA technology and genetic uh, manipulation, the ability of humans to actually take a piece of DNA, of course that's only a model, it's not what it looks like, but <laughs> to, <laughs> to be able to cut it up within the nucleases and being able to clone other pieces using ligases back into the, into the DNA. And so I studied molecular biology uh, for my masters, or honors and masters. And I was recruited by Albert or Ardia uh, into his A team. We called it Ardia's team. Into into um, in, at the end of '97, this was taken in '98, um, and uh, it was an immunology group. And I knew nothing about immunology. It was very uh, upsetting. But uh, I, <laughs> he wanted a molecular biologist to work on serum proteases. So at that stage, I, I joined this group, and I had a lovely time there until he passed away. After which, I uh, went into the group of Rob Warren and, and Paul. 
and this was the Department of Medical Biochemistry, 98. You will see some people you might know. I think that's Paul, Paul Brink, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Paul Van Elden, there's Eileen and Ardia and some other people there that you would recognize, 98. Uh, the tuberculosis research group was very small at that stage. This is a total TB researchers in the faculty at that stage. Uh, uh, with Nolda there and, and Rob Gee, a lot of, lot more hair there, and uh, me probably also, and <laughs> many other people that you recognize there, and got my PhD in 2002 on the Mycosins, a family of secreted subtilizin like serum proteases associated with immunologically important ESAT6 gene clusters of MTB. That's what I look like in the lab. Uh, if those of you haven't seen me in a lab coat and uh, did some uh, postdoctoral work and uh, Still later became a principal investigator, professor, and even uh, reached the papers for discovering a new TB causing organism in mongoose. So that's, that's uh, uh, in short, a brief history of, my, uh, of my, myself. Uh, my title of my talk is Ex Africa Semper Aliquid Novi, and that means out of Africa always something new. And now it's attributed to Pliny the Elder, uh, who actually in his Historia Naturalis quoted it as an old Greek saying. And um, uh, the saying being, Africa always brings us something new. And I would like to, in this talk, um, to, to show you how Africa always brings something new and has been doing that for many ages. Um, Pliny, uh, I'm, I have a great admiration for Pliny. He's, he was an extremely studious person who, uh, in addition to his official duties, kept on studying and uh, <laughs> continually reading, making notes. He, uh, he made extracts from numerous uh, historical books at that stage. His nephew, Pliny the Younger, said that he deemed all time wasted that was not employed in study. And he was actually taking notes as he was traveling during dinner. He had a person who was actually um, appointed to, to do shorthand writing of everything that he, that he um, said to him. He, he, in fact, died in the eruption of Pompeii. Uh, trying to help a friend of his getting, get, getting away from, um, uh, not the eruption of Pompeii, Vesuvius, uh, that, uh, that uh, destroyed Pompeii, of course. The second part of my talk will be on the intertwined genealogies of mycobacteria and man. By that mean, I mean the history, uh, uh, the evolutionary history of the mycobacteria with the history of man and how these two are intertwined and have been for over thousands of years. So you know one of my passions is history and, uh, or science and the other passion is history, genealogy. So I'd quickly like to, to run through a couple of genealogy slides if you, if you will bear with me. Because I think it's really important to know where you come from. And if you don't know where you come from, you don't know where you're going, you don't know where you've been, you don't know, mis you don't know the mistakes you've made and um, uh, how you ended up where you are. Genea genealogy, of course, coming from the Greek genius, uh, genia and logos, meaning uh, knowledge of generations, so knowledge of previous generations. And it can be applied also, uh, of course, it's usually used in the sense of humans, but it can be applied also on knowledge of the generation of bacteria. So it's very close to my heart, as, as Jimmy has mentioned. Um, I spent many years uh, doing genealogical research. Um, the origin of the family Hay was... Uh, probably around that time in, in Wiesel, when Johannes Gey was born uh, in, in this city. Um, he, his son, Jacobus Gey, was, uh, was a mayor and steward of Wiesel at that stage. And um, Wiesel was invaded by the Spanish in 1590, and so it looks like the family moved from, from Wiesel to Dortrecht later on, and later on to Zaltbommel, uh, where the Johannes Theodorus Gey was a revenue officer um, Rentmeester der Rumänen, and uh, he read, his son Johannes Gey registered as a medical student, actually did his medical studies at Leiden University, and later on took over the position of bailiff from his father. The first person we actually uh, know uh, or have a picture of uh, in the Gey van Petis family, my first ancestor that I have a picture of, is Adrianus Gey, the son of Johannes. He was a chief officer in engineering corps in Dutch military forces. And Adrianus Ge uh, lived in Bodengraven in, in the Netherlands. And his son, um, Adrian Ge, um, married uh, this lady, Johanna Luisa Friederica von Pythias. So you can clearly see that's where my surname comes from. Uh, their two sons, Adrian Rudolf and Karl, was very involved in, in the Napoleonic Wars. And uh, Adrian Rudolf, uh, um, for example, has been, it, it, has, it was written that he uh, saved the life of Napoleon uh, by picking up a hand grenade that was thrown at Napoleon's feet. He was one of Napoleon's officers during that time at the Battle of Smolensk in Russia. 
Um, he also took part in the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, and uh, he was a, a captain of that horse uh, artillery um, uh, battery. And so the, the family Gay and von Pitius uh, asked uh, for the surnames to be combined, and 1837 they got royal permission to do that. So that's the family tree of the of the Gay von Pitius family. Now, so why am I talk, uh, telling you all of this? I would like you to th to uh, to look at uh, family history th through the eyes of migration, through the eyes of <coughs> how people move around the world and where they go, um, because that will be, become important later in my talk. I would also like you to think about the, the role that Africa has played within this. So how, how did our family actually end up in Africa? And that's a very good question. I mean, they were all in, in the Netherlands. They were all very involved there. And at some stage, the family went to South Africa and. In fact, there's no more Gay van Pitties left in, in the Netherlands. So wh why, is, why is that? What happened here? For that, um, we have to think, uh, or we have to look further. We have to look at the Heinsius family. And the Heinsius family um, is in my direct line of descent. I, I uh, descend from Nicolaas Heinsius, born around 1500. So although I'm Nicolaas Claudius VI, I'm also Nicolaas XIII in, in the direct line of Heinsius. <laughs> So my name comes a very far, far road uh, from, from many years ago. And um, to look at how our family ended up in South Africa, um, you have to look at the Heinsius family. Um, I'm going to start with Daniel Heinsius. Uh, sorry, I pressed something. Yeah. I have to, uh, I'm going to start with Daniel Heinsius, one of the most famous scholars of the Dutch Renaissance. He was um, professor in Latin, professor in Greek, fourth librarian of the Leiden University. I think Ellen is here. She might find that interesting. Uh, 1612, he was appointed Professor Politicis, the world's first chair in political science. And his motto was quantum es quod nescimus, how much there is that we don't know. Um, and I think I might have inherited a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of his. <laughs> his son, uh, oh, sorry, before I go, go there, I thought, um, Hannes, I thought you guys uh, would be very interested in this. Nico Koopman, you might be interested in this. Uh, Daniel Ainsis was also the secretary of the Synod of Dort, which is a very influential synod uh, in the Dutch Reformed Church's history. So he, he attended that. His son was Nicolaas Ainsis, the elder, um, and he was also a Dutch classical scholar and poet. He collected one of the biggest private libraries in Europe, and after his death, about 13,000 books were sold off. So once again, I really think I have some, some <laughs> genes inherited from, from, from this Sainzius family, apart from my name. And um, the Puritan author John Flavel said of, of this uh, Nicolas Sainzius that when he shut himself up in his library at Leiden, that he reckons, reckoned himself placed in the very lap of eternity because he uh, conversed with there with so many divine souls. In any case, his son, Nicolas Heinsius the Younger, was also a writer, and uh, he studied medicine. He became a medical doctor at the age of 20, and um, unfortunately he had to flee the country in 1677 because he and several of his drunk friends committed manslaughter in the streets of The Hague. So unfortunately, um, they killed a butcher's servant in a, in a fight you know, that uh, broke up between drunken people. Uh, he had to roam Europe for many years trying to get away from the law, and. Um, uh, served as physician to royalty, including the Queen of Sweden. Um, we don't have any pictures of him because he didn't want himself to be painted because he was scared they would catch him. But we do have this picture of his backside. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he allowed that picture to be painted uh, with a big wig on, so you don't have any idea what his face looks like. Anyway, um, his son was Nicola, also Nicolas Heinsius. We don't know a lot about him. But the person who I would like to um, talk about is Nicolas Heinsius, his grandson. He was a commander at, uh, at the Dutch possessions in West Africa. And this is our, our link to, to Africa. Uh, he became the commission and commander of Fort Bartenstein, which you see a picture there of, uh, on the, on the uh, uh, Gold Coast of West Africa in Accra, in Butri at that stage, in the Dutch West India Company. This is from the other side of that fort. And you can see um, this is the place where he actually met uh, Hannah from Moria. And Hannah from Moria was a lady from the local Fanti uh, uh, tribe. And um, with Hannah from Moria, a, a, a Fanti name was Ajuba, which meant Monday, mean, meaning she was born on a Monday. With Hannah from Moria, he um, had two children. And one was a daughter, Anna Katharina Bartenstein Heinsius. 
And this is the Anna Katrita and Wartenstein Hensius, where my family actually comes from and where, where the um, link to Africa. Wartenstein Hensius, the daughter of Nicolas and Hannah, and uh, they had uh, their eldest son, Nicolas Claudius Gey. And so this was the first time the name Nicolas from the Hensius family came into the Gey family, and he was Nicolas Claudius the, f the first. He later became the clerk at the Ministry of Justice and Police at, um, uh, in, the, in the Netherlands. So we still don't know exactly how did they then come to South Africa because obviously they went back to the Netherlands. For that you have to look at his uncle, Jan Hendrik Gey. He was a colonel and commander of the Batavian Army Regiment at the Cape right here in 1803 to 1806. And he married a widow here, Maria Magdalena de Beer. Um, after the Battle of Blauberg, which is the only Napoleonic battle to be fought uh, in South Africa, uh, where uh, the, the, the Cape was actually given over to the, to the British from, uh, from the Dutch, he and his wife and stepdaughter from the previous um, marriage returned to, to uh, the Netherlands. And it's there where Nicolaus Claudius met Johanna Eveldina Wagner, his uh, uncle's stepdaughter, and they got married, and they had two children, and the rest of the family is descended from them. They returned to Cape Town in 1813. So they probably returned here because his wife was born here, his mother-in-law was born here, they wanted to come back. His mother was from Africa, his grandmother was an African woman, and they wanted to come back to, to, to Africa and, and stay here. So that's what we know, and why am I telling you all of this? Well, firstly, history is fascinating. I find it fascinating to find out these facts. Um, we know that our family have become integral in South Africa in many parts, but my, my great-great-grandfather, Nicolas Claudius, the, the second actually moved up into South Africa, later got, become pre became president of the Boer, very short-lived Boer Republic of Goshen. Uh, he was, in his young days, an elephant hunter, and um, um, uh, it's not a very good thing, but he actually has a record for killing the most elephants in one day. It was 100 elephants. So these days we, we frown on it, but those days it was uh, ivory trade and uh, that was what he, what he did. Um, but what, what these stories tells us is that people migrate. People move. People go where the opportunities are. People go where they want to live and where they find um, places to, to be uh, and to, to be themselves. Humans have been migrating for, for millennia. Um, it's, it's known that humans my, uh, you know, started off in, in Africa and over a number of many years, uh, millennia, they, they moved to the rest of, of, uh, of the world and they've actually inhabited all, basically all the places on Earth. Why do people migrate? They migrate to get away from conflict, they, they migrate to get away from oppression, to get away from war. They migrate towards better opportunities, they migrate towards better um, better lives, uh, they migrate towards places where their fam family are and where they are supported. This is exactly what happened to my grandmother and, and her, her, her family. My grandparents, Jochen and Maike, came with their four children from war-torn uh, Europe after the Second World War. 1952, they came on this boat, the Waterman, and they came to South Africa because they wanted to build a better life for themselves after they've been, been there. So it's clear that uh, humans are a wandering race, humans are a migrating race, and um, this has been happening for many, many years. It's still happening. I'm sure you've heard over the last few days on the radio that how people are discussing the migration of people from Africa through Serbia and, and, and Italy and all kinds of and boats collapsing with migrants on top of it. And this, is, uh, this has been in Time magazine about a week ago. Uh, where there's a whole article on people trying to migrate into the UK. And people do that because humans migrate and they are adapted or they, they are willing to, to sacrifice anything to get to certain places uh, where they will be able to build a better life for themselves. Um, the unfortunate thing is that diseases migrate with humans. And um, that's something that, that has been happening also for millennia. We know that leprosy, for example, also originated in Africa, spread all over the world during colonization and, uh, or, and, and before that. Uh, the same for smallpox, typhus, flu, many other diseases. It spreads through migration, people moving all over the world. And um, we know that the people in the, in the, in the New World basically got de decimated through diseases like smallpox and, and, and flu and other diseases because of the, these migrations. The, the disease I want to talk to you about this evening is tuberculosis. 
And I'd like to show you that tuberculosis also migrated with humans over millennia. So meet mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is the bacterium that causes tuberculosis. It's a slow-growing rod-shaped bacterium. It's remarkably well adapted to handle stressful conditions within the body. have a thick, complex cell wall structure. It's a deadly infectious disease. Usually attacks the lungs, but can also affect other parts of the body. You know, it's spread through the air, sneezing, coughing. People inhale those small droplets in which the bacteria resides and then gets tuberculosis, coughing, chest pain, fever, night sweats, weight loss, loss of appetite, fatigue, and coughing up of blood. This is one of the best descriptions I've ever read of what it is like to have tuberculosis. It was written by Charles Dickens in his novel, Nicholas Nickleby. And uh, he, uh, Charles Dickens knew very well what TB was. It was rife in Europe at that stage, and lots of people dying of tuberculosis, no drugs uh, to be used and no cure. And people, and he saw, he saw what tuberculosis did to people. There's a dread disease which so prepares the victim, as it were, for death, which so refines it of its grosser aspect and throws around familiar looks, unearthly indications of the coming change, a dread disease in which the struggle between soul and body is so gradual, quiet, and solemn, and the result so sure that day by day and the grain by grain, the mortal part wastes and withers away so that the spirit grows light and sanguine with its lightning load and, feeling immortality at hand, deems it but a new term of mortal life, a disease in which death takes the glow and hue of life, and life the gaunt and grisly form of death, a disease which medicine never cured, wealth warded off, or poverty could boast exemption from, which sometimes moves in giant strides and sometimes at a tardy pace, but slow or quick, is ever sure and certain. And that was what TB was at that stage in, in Europe. TB is the most lethal infectious disease in the history of mankind, and I don't know if many people know this, this is the deaths caused by AIDS in the last 200 years. Flu and, and plague and malaria, smallpox. This is tuberculosis. More than a billion people in the last 200 years died from tuberculosis. Its global impact is large. A third of the world's population is infected with a bacterium. That's, that's two, two billion people infected with this bacterium. Five to 10% only become active disease or get active disease per year. That's nine million per year and 1.5 million people die. This is the estimated TB incidence rates across the world in 2013. And you can clearly see that South Africa and Southern Africa is the hottest hit in the whole world. In Lesotho, South Africa and Swaziland, approximately one person every 100 develops active TB each year, making this the region with highest incidence of TB in the world. You can see this epidemiological burden up there and, and the co-burden of HIV makes it even worse. South Africa being hardest hit by this. Estimated HIV prevalence in new and relapsed TB cases. In Southern Africa, 61% HIV prevalence in TB cases in South Africa. This is an extremely worrying picture. On top of that, we have multi-drug and extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis. Once again, no surprise, South Africa, hardest hit by this. We have a huge number of multi-drug resistant cases. Less than 50% of these identified in 2010 were successfully treated. XDR TB, or extensively drug resistant cases, in 2011, the success rate was very poor, only 15%. 40% of these patients died. So this is a time bomb. These people are infectious and able to spread disease. So what do we do about this? What does the funding look like? Global public funding in 2009, 36 billion for HIV, 6 billion for malaria. Tuberculosis receives 2.9 billion um, rands of funding, uh, uh, dollars of funding worldwide. In 2015 alone, the World Bank was able to mobilize for Ebola 1.62 billion. Of course, Ebola is important, and of course, it's important to, to help uh, people with Ebola. But think of the load, the, the, the prevalence. 28,000 people are infected by Ebola since last year. It's the biggest outbreak of Ebola. But look at it in comparison to tuberculosis. More than 11,000 people died. 1.5 million deaths per year from tuberculosis. Compare that to HIV, 1.2 million deaths, and look at the difference in funding. We are not funding tuberculosis like we should be. The most uh, um, accurate description of how we treat tuberculosis as a disease is from a very unexpected source. I found this very strange. It came from Adolf Hitler in his Mein Kampf. Adolf Hitler said, it was no accident that man mastered the plague more easily than tuberculosis, and you could just as well have uh, changed plague for Ebola. 
The one comes in terrible waves of death that shake humanity to the foundations, Ebola or plague. The other slowly and stealthily, stealthily tuberculosis. The one leads to terrible fear and, and the other gradual indifference. And we, see, we saw that with the Ebola outbreak. Everyone, oh, Ebola, everyone. You know, we've, we're scared of the disease, but no one is scared of tuberculosis. Gradual indifference. The consequence is that man opposed the one with all the ruthlessness of his energy while he try, tries to control consumption of tuberculosis with feeble means. Thus he mastered the plague while tuberculosis masters him. And we heard the other day that there seems to be a vaccine now for Ebola that is 100% effective. It clearly illustrates this. We've been knowing tuberculosis is the cause of, or mycobacterium tuberculosis is the cause of tuberculosis for more, more than 100 years. We don't have a vaccine that can uh, prevent this disease. How did we end up in this situation? Well, mycobacterium man has had a very long and intertwined history. For every defense that we have developed, the bacterium has been able to counter this attack and outmaneuver our strategies. So to combat tuberculosis, we firstly have to understand the biology of the organism, which then causes the disease. So my work over many years have been to try and elucidate these mechanisms of the evolution of the mycobacteria, how they came here, and the development of mycobacterial pathogenicity and drug resistance. I tried to understand three things. Where did this organism come from? How does it cause disease? How, how is it pathogenic? And how can we find the diagnostics, and how can we stop it? So I strongly feel that discovering the biological basis of how mycobacteria are doing what it does and why there are such successful pathogens gives us the opportunity to interfere with that and try and stop it. History of TB has been, uh, TB has been identified thousands of years ago. It's documented in ancient China 2,700 years ago. In, in India, in 1,500 BC, it was called Yaksma, or gradual destruction. Herodotus wrote about it in the histories, and the father of modern medicine, Hippocrates, um, wrote about it. They called it physis from the Greek, which is uh, to waste away or decay. Um, Hippocrates said it was the most widespread disease of his time and noted that it was almost always fatal. He also warned his co-physicians to never go to a, a patient with advanced tuberculosis because it would surely ruin their reputation because the person was about to die. Uh, so much for the Hippocratic Oath, but anyway. Uh, a number of other ancient scholars also, including Pliny the Younger, who I mentioned earlier, um, uh, Aristotle, Galen, Vitruvius, and Arethius, also described tuberculosis in very detail and uh, various aspects of the disease. So it was a no well-known disease for thousands of years already. Physical evidence for TB also exists in many places around the world, from Egyptian mummies up to 5,400 years ago. We see the pathological signs of tubercular decay in the, in the bones of these mummies. Uh, characteristic skeletal changes, such as the collapse of the vertebra in, in POTS disease caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis, and MTB DNA being detected within these bones. The oldest evidence for MTB infection of modern humans came from a site called Atlet Yam, which is on the coast of Israel and uh, submerged the uh, Neolithic settlement dating to 9,000 years ago. So TB has been around for many ages. Also in the New World, Peruvian mummies dating to 1000 BC. It's, it's been around in human populations spread all over the world and, and physically isolated by geographical barriers for, for thousands of years. The, for many years, people wondered, was TB inherited or was it transmitted? Because families used to get tuberculosis. Benjamin Martin was the first person to actually say that TB may be caused by an old, airborne organism. He called it wonderfully minute cre living creatures. And um, uh, these creatures were only identified 100 years ago by Robert Koch, who, who identified M. tuberculosis as a causative agent of TB in his historical address at the Berlin Physiological Society in 1882. So since 1882, we've been known that tuberculosis is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. Mycobacterium tuberculosis forms part of the genus Mycobacterium, which is part of the class Actinobacteria, which actually are some of the most common soil life and plays an active role in, in carbon cycle and other ecological processes. But many st species within this genus have evolved mechanisms by which they can invade and uh, grow within host cells and make this its, its living space, including in birds, fish, amphibians, and mammals. If you don't like uh, gory pictures, my, maybe you want to close your eyes for the next slide, uh, because these are some of the diseases caused by uh, mycobacteria. And you can see leprosy there, um, mycobacterium marinum causing granulomas, abscesses, 
paratuberculosis causing Jonas disease, lymph nodes, tuberculosis, lymph adenitis, borrelia ulcer, etc. These are all caused by mycobacteria and they, they cause uh, they are able to invade uh, humans and, and other mammals and other animals. This is the genus Mycobacterium, containing around 130 known species, 30, uh, five subspecies and an additional 34 species that we know of that are not validly published yet. 60% of these have only been identified over the last 20 years, and um, mostly because of uh, genomics and uh, genome data. Most of them are fast growers, they are found in, in the environment, the rapid growers, and these are not usually non-pathogenic. But at some stage during the evolution of these organisms, they have acquired the ability to survive and live within an intracellular environment. And the slow growers, uh, the, the change from a fast growing to slow growing lifestyle have helped with that. Um, and then of course the M. tuberculosis complex containing a, no a small number of species have acquired the ability to specifically infect certain mammals. These are the members of the M. tuberculosis complex. You can see uh, chimpanzee bacillus, bacillus, mongoose bacillus, meerkat bacillus, dasi bacillus, etc. All of these species um, use these mammals as specific ecotypes and uh, most of them are, are very quite specific to, to these ecotypes, although they can cause disease in immune, compro immune compromised individuals also. They form three subgroups. The group one is the smooth tubercle bacilli, which is, includes M. canetti and other smooth tubercle bacilli. They are rarely isolated and, and usually found within the area of Djibouti. Infect humans, but the host range is not known well and they seem to come from an environmental reservoir. The group two uh, strains are, or species are the human adapted lineages and group three the animal adapted lineages. So the advent of whole genome sequencing changed the way we looked at mycobacterial um, research. When I joined uh, this faculty, we did not have a single M. tuberculosis genome sequenced. And uh, in, at the end of that year, we had one uh, genome, that of the laboratory strain, uh, H37RV. The other day I heard of one of the postdocs in the division that there's close to 700 strains just from our division already sequenced. Uh, thousands more in, in the rest of the world. Um, and so this genome contains about 4.4 megabases, um, high GC content, around 4,000 genes. And most importantly, 40% of these genes are known, unknown. We don't know what they do. The advent of the genomics era was, very, uh, it was a very interesting time to, to, um, uh, to be part of. This was when I started studying, uh, 1993. Only 100,000 sequences were known in GenBank, which is the place where everyone submits their sequences, with 120 million bases. From 2002, it became so much that they split the whole genome sequences from the, from the others. And in this month, I checked 190 million sequences containing 200, um, uh, 200 billion bases and an additional 300 million whole genome sequences containing 1,200 billion bases. And you can clearly see why we need people like Gerard Tromp, uh, the bioinformaticians, with such a huge amount of data and bioinformatics, it becomes very, very necessary. Uh, this allows us to do whole genome alignments and aligning the genomes of these different species and strains to, uh, to each other to see where the differences are and what makes them special. If we look at the agents of genome variation, single nucle nucleotide polymorphisms, it's single changes or insertions and deletions, uh, duplications, horizontal gene transfer events and pseudogenization or deletions. We could see things like this happening within the genomes. You can see here a single nucleotide change from a C to a T. You can see here a deletion of a part of the genome. And these changes on a genomic level makes a difference to the, on the proteomic level. So either proteins are not expressed anymore, it's not functional anymore, um, it's changed its function. And, and so these things happen on a continuous basis and it allows straination and speciation to take place. Just a, a very small example of a part of the genome of certain mycobacteria. And you can clearly see here the same gene, the other genes on the sides are also the same. And in this position, uh, the same gene on that side, and on this position, this um, organism has actually uh, had an insertion of a lipoprotein. Uh, there's a deletion of that lipoprotein, an insertion of a PE, or PPE protein and actually a duplication of that PPE protein. And so this small region, a very interesting example of what's happening and what we could see if we use comparative genomics investigating species variation. 
So this allowed us to do comparative microbacterial genomics on both a genus and a complex level as well as a strain level. We would compare these genomes with each other and looked at, look at how these changes took place and how the, the evolution of the bacteria took place. Add to that the modern technologies of transcriptomics, which uh, looks at gene expression profiling, and proteomics, which of course looks at the different proteins within uh, organisms. And proteins being much more complex because they express the different times and the different conditions uh, in different cells. And uh, new technologies like um, uh, mass, uh, you know, the, the um, MS uh, equipment that can actually pick up at least 2,500 of the 4,000 microbacteria allows us to look at comparisons between genomes. And lately also metabolomics, the products of the enzymes, the enzyme reactions and small molecules. And add that all together and you come up with a science where if you use these technologies to look at microbacteria, we call it mycobacteromics. So using mycobacteromics, we've done a lot over the last 20 years. Uh, we looked at the evolution of virulence in mycobacteria and, and uh, uh, um, evolution of drug resistance and many other things. So how, did, uh, how do we think uh, virulence evolved in mycobacteria? As I said earlier, most of the uh, slow growers, uh, or the fast growers are saprophytes, the slow growers mostly pathogenic. And we see that a lot of genes were horizontally transferred into the, into the microbacteria during the evolution of mycobacterium tuberculosis. At least 137 genes, many of which involved in metabolic functions related to adaptation to anaerobic conditions. It seems like the emergence of the ancestor of the tubercle bacilli took place at a time when horizontal gene transfer allowed the bacterium to live within protozoa, which were also found in the soil. And uh, this increased the capacity of the mycobacteria to survive killing and to allow it to resist uh, killing um, and allowed it to emerge as an ancestor of the tubercle bacilli able to live within the cells and not be killed like the non-pathogenic mycobacteria. At some stage in the evolution, it infected early humans and the first changes that took, started took place were host adaptation, large number of duplications of sequences and we know duplication allows for redundancy and uh, redundancy allows for, for sequences to evolve into different functions. 52% of the proteome of the organism derived from gene duplication events. And it's in gene duplication that I publish most of my work. Uh, at least two of these papers were seminal papers receiving more than 460 citations and downloaded from the internet more than 52,500 times. And uh, evolving, uh, revolving around the idea of the ESAT-16 cluster being duplicated a number of times, as well as the expansion of the PE and PPE protein families. This is where I'm going to show you a little bit of molecular biology and I'm trying to, I'll try to get that pass as quickly as possible. So the duplication of the ESAT-6 gene clusters took place five times within the genome of mycobacterium tuberculosis. And it became clear over time that this cluster is very important for the virulence of the organism. How do we know that? During 1908 and 1921, two Frenchmen, Albert Calmet and Camille Garin, uh, developed Mbovis BCG, which is the vaccine that we vaccinate babies. Uh, against tuberculosis, against, uh, it protects against malaria, TB, TB meningitis. And so people wondered why is this vaccine, it's still alive, it's still growing, why is it attenuated, why doesn't it cause disease anymore? So they look at the genome of this organism and it's clear that during this uh, number of years of passaging, a deletion took place, this deletion called RD1. And this deletion caused the attenuation of the organism, meaning that the organism does not cause disease anymore. And this deletion took place in ESAT-6 gene cluster region one. So one of the five gene clusters present within mycobacterium tuberculosis. And that's the region that got deleted over there. And since then, many other examples of species which are attenuated in humans um, have shown that they have deletions within this region. It turned out later on, after many years of studies, that this forms a dedicated multi-component binding protein dependent active transport system. Uh, that encodes a novel type 7 secretion system. So we've known about six types of secretion systems before this one. This is a novel type 7 secretion system, which secretes into alia the, the members of the ESAT6 and CFP10 families. And both these proteins are very important in the, in the immunological um, uh, reactions of, of humans against tuberculosis. Um, it also was later to show that uh, these uh, proteins actually allows the escape of the organism from the phagosome into the cytosol. And so this is the pathogenicity mechanism that it uses. We also used bacterial comparative genomics between different species and strains within these uh, different genera 
to look at how this region duplicated over time. What happened? How did it, why is there five of these within mycobacterium tuberculosis? So we look at the whole genome sequences of 32 mycobacterial species, seven additional actinomycetes, and uh, three other bacteria, Bacillus subtilis, Listeria monocytogenes, and Staphylococcus aureus, all have one cluster, one ESAT6 region, region four, which is the oldest or most ancient region, and um, uh, pro present only in one copy in these organisms. In, in the Coranobacteria, the Gordonia, Rudococcus, and Orcardia, we found ES64, which is the ancestral one, um, and in all of these species, only this one copy. And then in Orcardia farcinica, we found two copies. And this was an ancestral copy of ES6 region 3. So this was the first duplication, which also received an insertion of PE and PPE proteins. In mycobacteria, we see that the fast growers, the non mostly non-pathogenic strains, there were only two or three of these clusters, while in the slow growers, we had five. And so this is the scenario that, uh, that evolved from this, that uh, in, in all of these bacteria, there were only one cluster. At some stage during evolution, this was duplicated into two in Ocardia. In, in, uh, in the early mycobacteria, it still only has two. And later on in the fast growers, it has three regions. And in M tuberculosis, it was duplicated into five regions, of which two of them are involved in the pathogenicity of the organism very clearly. Um, and how, how this took place was through plasmids. And plasmid uh, encoded AESX regions was found in a number of species. And it's clear that when you do the phylogenetics of these plasmids, they link up to all the different clusters. So it seems that these plasmids were the vehicles that uh, allowed the duplication of the regions. Linked to these regions are also the P and PPE protein families. These are large multi-gene families of 99 and 68 members, making up 10% of the genome of the organism, of very immunological significance, and very important and implicated in the virulence of the organism. This is a structure of the different subfamilies of the P and PPE proteins, and some of them as large as 1,400 amino acids. They come in pairs in the genome, and they have been shown uh, through crystal structures to form a complex. Um, and they're also present within the ESX gene cluster regions. And, uh, situated in, duplicated from, and um, associated with. And we saw that uh, in the ancestral ESX4, no P and PPE proteins were present. In ana other actinobacteria in the ancestral region 4, also no P and PPEs. The, uh, the first presence we found for a P and PPE cluster was in the actinobacteria, uh, where ESPG acts as an adapter that recognizes specific protein complexes. And so in, in Orcardia, when the first duplication of ESX uh, region 4 into 3 took place, this PEPPE ESPG cluster got inserted and since then been co duplicated with the region. This is Mycobacterium smegmatis containing three ESX gene clusters and only two pairs in the whole genome. And then M tuberculosis that got co duplicated. And since the duplication of region 5, there's been a massive expansion of the PEPP proteins up to at least 99 of the one and 68 of the others. And this, uh, this duplication of ES65 took place um, in, the, in the change over from a fast growing to a slow growing lifestyle. So this is a phylogenetic tree of all the members of the PMPP protein family. You can clearly see the ancestral PMPPs there, only present, the only ones present in smeg martyrs, and the massive expansion of these proteins also the PE, PE proteins. And when you look at comparative genomics of the different genomes of the organism, you can clearly see that it links up to the uh, mycobacterial uh, sequence or species in the different uh, fast and slow growing categories. So this is the picture that emerged. The fast growers and uh, of course the, the bacteria outside of this um, uh, genus not containing PPEs except for the nocardia. Um, the fast growers only containing two pairs of these ancestral proteins. And when the duplication of ESX5 took place within the slow growers, uh, and the, and the co-duplication uh, and expansion of the PE and PPE proteins took place, there was this massive uh, explosion of, of uh, these proteins in the, in the organisms, especially the MPTR and PGRS subfamilies in the M tuberculosis complex, clearly showing that these were involved in, in the, the um, differentiation into, into an obligate pathogenic lifestyle. So it has been also been shown by our group and, and our collaborators that, uh, that this region 5 secretes the PP and PP protein families through, through the secretion system. And in fact, looks like it is a nutrient import system. So uh, the slow-growing uh, mycobacteria don't make use of porins. And um, 
the fast growers makes use of it, but it has been shown that porins are detrimental to the survival of fast growing mycobacteria in, intracellularly. So the slow growers they therefore make use of ESX5 and the PMPP protein. So genome de downsizing has taken place in M. lepra, not needing the PMPPEs anymore for its, its specific lifestyle, and it's lost more than 2,000 genes, including a large number of PMPP proteins. Uh, the other organism is, that does that is M. ulcerans, where you, once again you see a lot of pseudo genes and uh, genes being lost. So the other selective, original selective force was coevolution. We've looked at host adaptation. Our coevolution was when the organism evolved with the lineages of humans that uh, moved out of Africa. Africa is the cradle of humankind. Our species is an African one, and most of our time on Earth we've spent in Africa. Um, this is where we started. Around 60 to 70,000 years ago, we decided to leave Africa, and there's many theories about that. One of them is the climatic changes, and um, people decided to look for better places to live. They moved over that strait there, which at that stage was very shallow because of the glaciers that took up a lot of water from the seas. And uh, this is also the same region where we find the most ancestral mycobacterium tuberculosis complex organisms, Canetti, the smooth tubercle bacilli, and others. And they reached uh, Australia by around 50,000 years ago, w w moving around the beaches along the side. And lots of paleontological evidence for this. Also, when we look at our Y chromosome haplogroups, human migration patterns comes from that. And this links up to my, my uh, previous mentioning about people looking for places where, and, and looking, uh, moving because they're looking for a better life. Uh, the, the Y chromosome haplogroups, uh, there, there you see them. They also correspond very well to the mitochondrial DNA haplogroups, showing clearly the movement out of Africa to other parts of the world. And, and finally, about eight to 10,000 years ago, into, into the uh, parts of the Americas. But Africa is not only the cradle of humankind, it's also the cradle of TB kind. And um, uh, M tuberculosis complex actually also originated in Africa. We can clearly see that M canetti and these ancestral strains are only found in, in Africa. Uh, M africanum also, um, the human adapted strains uh, of M, M africanum, only found in West Africa. Chimpanzee bacillus, Mungi and Dasi, they're all only found in Africa. And it's only later when some of these other species, including bovis, which obviously came together with the cattle uh, into, into other parts of the world. These are the M. tuberculosis lineages, and you can clearly see how they line up to different parts of the world. The most ancestral lineages situated over here, and then the more modern lineages over here. And when you look at the map of the world with those lineages, M. canetti situated there, that is uh, the Indo-Oceanic um, uh, lineage situated over there, the Ethiopian lineage situated over there. These are the most ancestral mycobacterial lineages. And you can clearly see that how this follows the route of human spread throughout the world. Um, East African uh, Indian lineages, the, the, the uh, East Asian lineages, and the more modern European or uh, Euro-American lineages. And then, of course, the West African lineages situated over there. So this was the position um, up to about 500 years ago, where these human populations were geographically separated from each other with their own specific uh, mycobacterial lineages linked to, to those populations. And physical boundaries, because of geographical barriers, there were no airplanes. Uh, people who didn't intermix uh, quite well. These lineages actually specialized within these human populations. In came colonization, historical European trade routes, and shipping, and uh, sh uh, people uh, discovering different parts of the world through, through uh, shipping. And the spread of mycobacterium tuberculosis, European lineages took place. And so the, the Americas and, and other parts of Africa and Asia, as well as some of these strains being brought back from the, from the Asian um, environments. So these are the major lineages we find, and we see therefore that over a period of a large number of years, uh, at least 70,000 years, humans have co-adapted and co-evolved with these strains and species in isolation before the colonial, uh, colonialization of the world caused these genotypes to, to actually meet new, uh, or caused these strains of tuberculosis to actually meet new genotypes of humans. This co-adaptation caused one of the conditions that, is that TB is most well known for, and that is latency. It's able to persistently infect a host without causing disease for a long period of time. It could be years, up to decades. It could be never that, uh, that it actually activates. 
as I said, estimated at around a third of the world's population latently infected by this organism. And this kept this, this, kept this relationship between the, this intertwined relationship between the bacteria and the human for many thousands of years before, um, before the, the um, historical or the historical trade routes um, messed up this uh, situation. We see in South Africa a lot of lineages from Europe and we see a lot of from East Asia. And it's clear South Africa was this point where the two cultures met. People went to East Asia and they came back and they brought slaves and they brought uh, other people and they came back to South Africa and these lineages met up here. So in South Africa we see a miscellany of M. tuberculosis strains. There was even advertisements in the Illustrated London News uh, in the 1800s saying that we've got a climate ideal for curing tuberculosis in South Africa. People should come here to cure the tuberculosis. Lots of sunshine, nice place. Uh, it attracted really large numbers of tuberculosis uh, migrants. People with fresh cases of tuberculosis came from all over the world to South Africa to try and be cured. This was a time before drugs. Um, no one was able to you know, cure TB in, in, by using uh, any drugs, uh, vaccines. And they came here because the sunlight helped them to cure. And interestingly enough, I don't know how many people know this, but Cecil John Rhodes came to South Africa because he had tuberculosis as a child. And his father sent him here and said, come to South Africa because you need to get cured from tuberculosis. So South Africa as a country would look much, uh, very different if it wasn't for tuberculosis, because Cecil John Rhodes wouldn't have been here. <laughs> Apart from the fact that UCT wouldn't have been uh, needed to take down a statue. But anyway, he had a huge influence on South African history, and, and uh, this was all caused by tuberculosis. So we actually have a mix of strains from Europe, and we have a mix of strains from, from East Asia in this country. And we're very hard hit in terms of our strains. These are some of the strain families that we have here. If we look at our study population of Ravensmead and Eitzig just outside of this hospital, we, we're sitting right there now. Sorry, right there now. <laughs> That's the hospital. Um, this is our study population, or one of our study population of Ravensmead and Eitzig. And in this area, we've isolated more than 9,000 isolates of tuberculosis with more than 875 different strains of M. tuberculosis within this small area. 290 strains per square kilometer come from two families, F11 and F29. This one coming from Europe, this one coming from East Asia. So we have a very nice mix, if you can call it nice, of two different uh, strain families. Beijing's making up around 25% of our strain families. And this is work done by Guillaume van Spee, who's also in the audience here, showing very nicely how Strain, uh, strains fight with each other for, for, uh, for the best opportunities and Beijing uh, being a very strong strain, being able to double over time at a rate of 3.9 years. And this is very worrying, of course, to see this. So what did humans do? We came up with antimicrobials. We said, let's fight this bacterium and let's give it antimicrobials and we'll destroy it. In fact, uh, this is Salman Wax Waxman. In 1964, he wrote a book, The Conquest of Tuberculosis, because he was the discoverer of streptomycin, uh, the wonder drug that would cure tuberculosis. And it was used for tuberculosis. And, um, he said that, but, but most important, the ancient foe of man known as consumption, the great white plague, tuberculosis, or by whatever other name is on its way to being reduced to a minor ailment of man. The future appears bright indeed, and the complete eradication of the disease is in sight. He could, he could not, this was written in 1964, he could not have been more wrong, um, unfortunately, because the bacterium fought back. So humans uh, forgot that for every reaction, there's a reaction, uh, for action, every action, there's a reaction. And microbacteria saw this, uh, these drugs, and they, they uh, underwent genetic uh, mutations, single nucleotide polymorphisms in the, in the targets of these drugs, and antimicrobial um, resistance became rife. Uh, the WHO last year said that antimicrobial resistance is a serious threat to, to the world, and it's happening all over the world. So we see multidrug resistant tuberculosis cases in, in, in 10,000 to 15,000 cases of MDR TB per year in South Africa at this stage. That's plus minus 30 per 100,000 population. This um, drug-resistant epidemic has also arrived in the Western Cape, and this was an article published in Nature Medicine a couple of years ago where they referenced our laboratory as having this vast collection of TB strains. We did some work on the drug-resistant epidemic here and showed that the MDR doubling time is up to four years, with the Beijing's once again 
this R220 strain, a doubling time of only 2.38 years. That is very worrying. And we see evolving of MDR TB also in extensively drug resistant and totally drug resistant TB in different strain families, interestingly enough, along the coast of South Africa and um, you know, F11s in, in KwaZulu Natal, the atypical Beijing's found in Port Elizabeth in Eastern Cape and the uh, 220s here. So if you look at the timeline of microbacterial drug resistance, it's around 13 years. The first time RIF was included in treatment, 1972, 13 years later, first MDR TB case. 12 years later, 97, the first extensively drug resistant case. And now 12 years later, 2009, the first what we call totally drug resistant case. That's a new threat, totally drug resistant case. There's no official definition for it yet, but it seems to be super uh, XDR TB or totally untreatable XDR TB or extremely drug resistant TB. It's resistant basically to all second line drugs and extremely difficult to cure. This is a paper by Marisa Klopper from our group. She showed that in the Eastern Cape, 93% of the atypical XDR Beijing isolates had resistance to at least 10 anti-TB drugs and uh, some of them another, uh, an 11th one. That means we don't basically have anything left to fight this disease if, if we allow this to, to spread further. And what is happening? Once again, migration. People migrate to better opportunities, to a better life. They want to get away from disease, they want to get away from sickness. And what's happening is people from the Eastern Cape is migrating to the Western Cape. This is a paper, a very recent paper, just accepted by Lesma Streich, I hope she's also in the audience here, where she showed that 53% of the patients infected with atypical Beijing XDR TB are genetically extremely closely related to those reported in the Eastern Cape. And this signifies that people are migrating with their extensively drug resistant TB from the Eastern Cape to the Western Cape. And the, the XDR TB academic is now spreading in the Western Cape, extremely uh, um, uh, influenced by, or strongly influenced by the migration from the Eastern Cape. So the bacteria at this stage is winning again. And we need to do something about that. The other modern uh, selective force that actually came in was HIV. Out of Africa, something new arose. And once again, HIV, in the west coast of Africa, incidentally also where my family, part of my family comes from. And uh, first known human case of uh, HIV in Kinshasa, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It originated in non-human primates and in HIV was introduced in the human population when these hunters uh, in, uh, were exposed to infected blood. What did HIV do? It claimed more than 34 million lives since 81. Um, around 1.2 million people die from HIV-related causes per year. And once again, Sub-Saharan Africa, hardest hit by this disease, 28.5 million people living with HIV. TB and HIV has an unholy alliance between this virus and bacterium. It, uh, it allows a synergy, allowing for the acceleration and decline in, in uh, immunological functions. If we don't treat tuberculosis in HIV patients, it's the most common presenting illness among people living with HIV. It's fatal if undetected or untreated. It's the leading cause of death among H people with HIV. The bacterium um, is inhibited by the immune system. If the immune system is broken down, the bacterium uh, just goes ahead and does whatever it wants. It's the first time in the history of the bacterium that it actually encounters this type of environment where it can just go ahead and do whatever it wants. It's fatal, as I said, in, in roughly 25% of HIV-associated deaths. And people infected with HIV are 26 to 31 times more likely to get active tuberculosis. This is the HIV epidemic in South Africa. First official case of AIDS in 1982. Uh, it's a pity this graph doesn't go back further, but it, it comes from around here. It, uh, tuberculosis in the red came along the steady pace of around 200 notifications per 100,000. HIV in the blue. And you can clearly see where the two started to meet each other. Things started to change. And HIV and TB now has this alliance between each other. And once again, this new modern selective force is taking place and influencing the intertwined genealogies of mycobacteria in man. So in summary, I'm, I'm sorry for the long lecture, uh, but it has been a long and intertwined history with mycobacteria. And, uh, uh, apologies that my lecture was also long and intertwined. <laughs> we have had a long history with, with mycobacteria. Uh, at least 70,000 years since the humans started to migrate out of Africa, these original selective forces of 
human adaptation firstly and then co-evolution with different genotypes of humans throughout the world and then redistribution over the last 500 years as people started to travel uh, through faster mechanisms than walking and then in the last few years only modern selective forces of antimicrobials and HIV so this is a long war that is not over yet we've we've won a couple of battles against the bacterium and the battle, uh, the, the bacterium has actually won some more battles. And at this stage, it is, it's getting the upper hand. And uh, the war is far from being over. In conclusion, Sun Tzu said that um, if you know your enemy and you know yourself, you can win 100 battles without a single loss. If you know yourself but not your opponent, you may win or you may lose. There's no guarantee. If you know neither, then you will always endanger yourself. I personally feel that we need to know this enemy. We need to know where it came from. We need to know how it works, what it does, how its pathogenicity arose, and how we can actually detect and, and uh, conquer it. Only last year, Jonathan Merman, the director of the USA CDC, said the following, we've made substantial progress towards TB elimination in this country. Of course, referring to the USA. In South Africa, it's much worse. He said, but TB remains a formidable opponent with thousands of cases still diagnosed each year. TB can be fatal and treatment remains long and difficult. This ancient bacterium has demonstrated its ability to evade our tax attacks many times before. And that is truly the case. So finally, my work over the past two decades has specifically focused on trying to understand how the mycobacteria have evolved to be such successful human pathogens. And this led me to this, through this fascinating voyage uh, of discovery through time and has allowed me to get a glimpse of the extraordinary intertwined genealogies of mycobacteria and man. A relationship which began many thousands of years ago in the eastern part of Africa and a continent from which we came from, which mycobacteria came from, and which both we and mycobacteria returned. And uh, on which one of the largest battles in this age old war is currently being fought. So who will win? Only time will tell. There's many battles still ahead. We need to find new ways to, um, to attack and uh, try and conquer this organism. The war is far from over with both sides trying to outmaneuver each other. At this stage, I'm afraid, uh, if you look at those pictures, the bacterium has the upper hand. And the intertwined history of mycobacterium in man is still in the making. Thank you. Mm -hmm.